Hi there, welcome to My Week, I'm Christy McDonald. We are starting with the concept of Michigan Divided. Over the last year, the Center for Michigan and Bridge Magazine followed the lives of a group of voters from across the state and got a sense of why they held certain beliefs. And they ended up with a documentary that really gives you an idea of how culturally divided we are and starts conversations of what policies and issues really matter and if we can ever bridge that divide. And that will be a key in a big election year. Nolan Finley is off, but with me at the table is Stephen Henderson of WDET Radio. And joining both of us is John Bebo. He is the CEO of the Center for Michigan and Ron French, senior writer for Bridge Magazine, who also wrote and produced this documentary, Michigan Divide. Ron, hey, welcome to my week. It's well, good thank to you. see it's you. It's a pleasure to find John, you. welcome really, back. Uh, I don't think it's a pleasure to, to carry Ron's bag today. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> All right, so I love the, starting off this, this discussion of the concept of, of Michigan Divided, and whereas Center for Michigan, you've done so many community conversations over the year. You have Bridge Magazine. Why delve into the documentary territory? And I'm going to start with you on this, John. Well, after a decade of community meetings and, and you know, bringing people together to talk about issues, uh, 2017 did not feel to us like a year where we could bring people together in community meetings and, and get much more than shouting. Um, so we, we took a completely different tact mm -hmm. and we did some polling, we did some focus groups, and, and that informed our sense of how divided the, the state is now. So we decided, let's just go out and ask a lot of questions and embed with just a few families and try to get a deeper understanding of the divide that way before we go about trying to somehow solve it. Right, so is this a process of how long run and, and how much time did you spend with each, was it six families? It was six families. Uh, it started as a project uh, in Bridge Magazine where we followed 11 families. And it took us about two weeks to realize, you know, there's more here than, than what we can just do in Bridge. Let's, let's, let's try to put together a documentary. So we followed six families from around the state, um, from the UP um, all the way to Grand Rapids and Flint, and uh, with very different points of view and just tried to get a sense of what their lives were like because we tried to pick people who, in this environment today, people often stereotype and have, have views of what their lives are like and why they think the way they do. We wanted to sort of get into their lives and see if there's really common ground there. It kind of think assumptions is what gets us into trouble in the first place, Stephen. Yeah. yeah, no, that's right. I mean, we don't know each other very well in this state if you uh, go too far outside of the, the city or the county that you, that you live in. Uh, and it's also true that, that our politics and our politicians I think have taken some pride, I want to say, in in heightening those divisions, right? Uh, if you're representing people from Ishpeming, you're looking at Detroit and saying, the reason your life is not good up here is because of what happens down there. And they're taking your money or they're taking from you. You know, the uh, I'm going to borrow a phrase from someone pretty close to me. When the gruel is thin, the knives are sharp. Mm. And the gruel has been thin here in Michigan for a while. And the knives are sharper than they maybe have ever been. You know, John, it, was it surprising to you some of the response that you were able to see? Now, you, you re released this documentary yesterday for mm -hmm. the first time on, on, on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, what was some of the response <clears throat> to it? Um, we released it at, a, at a, one of a series of policy conferences this, the center is hosting around this, the state uh, this spring. Um, and I, I would describe the audience as, as thoughtful and pensive. It, they, had, they had listened to three big policy discussions all morning and then, and then we gave them a movie to watch and people didn't move. They just sat there and watched and, and just kind of took it in and then we had some discussion afterwards and, and, and I, mean, I mean, that was the first audience so it's a small sample but, but what we're hoping to do is, is, to, is to prompt people thinking about, okay, what happens after the shouting? Mm -hmm. We're all mad at each other. Um, maybe we don't all understand each other very well. At the end of the day, we've got a lot of kids to educate. We've got an economy to run. We've got roads we have to fix. What do we do when we're done shouting? That's an interesting concept. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the people that you, uh, that you followed in Michigan Divided. What do politicians not understand about you? Oh. <laughs> what it's truly like living up here. Yeah. yeah. How hard it is, and it's not by choice. I think they need to live in our shoes once. Yep. Um, Get rid literally. of their credit cards, drive yep. our old unreliable beater car everywhere, yep. try to feed your children on $730 a month. Good luck. Yeah. 
it doesn't matter if you're old, young, or rich, poor. Just what about just treating a person like a human being? Why does it have to be a Democrat versus Republican? It's almost like a gang. You know what I mean? Like we're the we're the Crips and we're the Bloods, or we're the Hell's Angels and we're the something else. I don't know. We're the Reds and we're the Blues. Right, we're the Reds and Blues. It's like they're gangs, and they forget that people are people are affected by this turf war. <laughs> Why can't they just fix it? I don't understand. I'm afraid for my kids. I'm afraid for them growing up and being in fear. I'm afraid for my daughter, afraid to wear the hijab. Nobody should be afraid to live in their own country. We were born and raised there. As a small business owner, I feel like I've had a target on my back. They're looking at guys like me. How can we get more money out of them? And I, I see it on the local level. You know, it just happens in the state and Fed. I've always told people if the liberals would be for smaller government, balanced budgets, keeping us economically strong and militarily strong, I would be a liberal. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because I, I feel that the theme here is people are saying, you don't understand me and you will never understand me. How, how can we start to, I guess, bridge that divide, Ron? Or is that, is that the kind of feeling that you got from interviewing uh, these people in this documentary? Well, first, they're all fascinating people. Yeah. Really good people, completely different points of view politically, but they're all really good people. And, but what, what, what I found fascinating is when we spoke to these six people, you know, many times in their homes and in their work, is that how similar these people were, you know. Um, they all want better roads. They all want uh, clean uh, water. Um, they all <laughs> are very frustrated with our politicians. Um, they agree on 95% of things, yet that other 5% is keeping them from talking to each other, and so it's hard for anyone in the state to actually solve anything. So where do you go then from here, Stephen? I mean, when you hear, when you see that divide, say, we agree on actually so much, but yet we're it feels like we're so much further apart than we ever have been before. Well, I mean, some of it again has to reflect back on the leadership uh, on both sides. I mean, they have they have stoked this this difference up into a huge conflagration in a way that that it never really was before and doesn't deserve to be. I mean, as you point out, people have more in common. Uh, then they have uh, differences. Uh, but as, as long as people are going to the ballot box each year and thinking, what's in this for me, and how can I make sure that the other people out there don't take more of what I have, uh, you have no shot at electing people who will bring us together. Uh, you have no shot at policy that will fix the problems that we all have in common. And right now, the political class in Michigan benefits from that. Uh, and I think, I think uh, if you look at it, it's more on one side than the other. I do feel like the Republican Party has made more of that uh, than the Democrats have, but there, there are certainly uh, uh, people on the left side of the ledger who are, who are guilty of the same thing. But as long as that's the case, it, it's really hard to, to talk about what a solution would look like. Roads is a great example. Uh, we, we every year deal with the consequences of our poor decisions policy decisions in terms of roads, but when it comes time to talk about real solutions, uh, everyone says, well, I don't want to pay more than you pay, uh, or you're not paying enough, I pay too much. Uh, it becomes a zero-sum game really quickly. So I think it's really interesting, and John, and the work with the center does, is you're able to kind of gather the thought of what everyone is talking <clears throat> about and then hand deliver it to the policymakers, to our politicians, and say, hey, look, this is what people are thinking and this is what they want to see. Do you find them receptive to what, um, to people, uh, what, what people are saying? I think um, 2016, and, and this isn't a pro-Republican or pro-Democrat statement, I think 2016 really changed that that dynamic of being able to talk to political leaders. I think it, it created a much wider fissure um, among policymakers, and it is, it's why we've changed our approach of, of what we're doing to engage the public. Uh, because it, the, the old approach, and we, we had some successes back in the day of going out there town hall style, uh, mm -hmm. shining community meeting on the hill and going to leaders and solving problems. We were able to do some of that, but that is not the climate we're in today. Um, we find ourselves at the center and, and bridge in 2018 feeling like 
we're simply in a, in a situation where we have to determine, uh, protect, and amplify fact. I mean, uh, if we can't agree on a common set of facts mm -hmm. uh, of what's really going on in our state, then, then we can't hope to, to solve some of the problems. So that, that's, we've gone, we've gone from everybody solve problems and take it to the leaders and see if you can get something done to, at this point, let's just protect fact and, and let's engage people in, in the question of why are we shouting all the time? Is that disappointing to you? Yeah, uh, it's, it's immensely um, challenging to, to, no one should feel sorry for us, but it's immensely challenging to, to do the kind of work we set out to do today. I mean, at, at Bridge, what we're trying to do with our nonprofit journalism is, is drive home big picture stories and issues, driven by the best facts you can find and the be best data. Uh, and what we saw in 2016 was an exacerbation of a, of a long-standing problem. It's not just politicians that, that the public doesn't trust, it's the media. Uh, and that is a more severe problem than we think it's ever been. So we're, we're kind of going off the rails and trying some very different things this year. We've bought a mobile citizenship van. We're just gonna go to 100 communities and just listen. Mm -hmm. I think part of the problem that the, the, the media faces, uh, and, and we saw this in the 2016 presidential election, is this idea of, of, of if you go into communities, you're just helicoptering, and you're not going to very many communities. There wasn't a lot of attention to the, to the, the sense of rage in, in Michigan and Wisconsin and, and places. Um, not enough, anyway, by, by some of the candidates, and also not enough reporting that really got to the, to the depth of that, which is what we're trying to answer with some of the work we're talking about today. And you bring up the media and, and kind of how, I think, a lot of media outlets are starting to, they have to think about how they're operating in 2018 and especially going into an election year. Um, you talk about it in Michigan Divided. Let's go ahead and take a look at what people had to say. Today, I don't think people spend time nurturing any sort of relationship. It's more, you're wrong and I don't have to listen to you anymore. I'm gonna unfriend you. <laughs> people can't sit through a two minute video anymore. They can't barely sit through 30 seconds. So. How do you really give somebody the facts and get them to be knowledgeable on something if we're only listening to these sound bites all the time and then making an opinion? Is it just the media or? or I, I think it's a general digital divide, that it's not the media. I think it's all driven by the media. And I wouldn't necessarily say fake media because I don't even know what that means. But I have to tell you, the, the media is, honest to God, if this stuff, if what went on 20 years ago, I mean, it would be blasphemy. I mean, I, I think they're totally irresponsible. Totally, totally. All right, so um, obviously it's interesting. How do you get beyond those sound bites or get people to, to immerse beyond, beyond the sound bites, Stephen? Well, I mean, I think uh, it was interesting, the, the, the last uh, speaker there talking about media and how it's all our fault and that uh, we're, we're doing things and saying things that we didn't do 20 years. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, the proliferation of media and the, the, the outlets that exist now that didn't then, I think, uh, have, have changed not just the, the rules but the game itself, right? It looks really different. But I also, you know, I would also have been interested in hearing her talk about the difference between media outlets and social media. I think social media is... But I think that's the is, problem, though. The line is totally blurred because people are getting their news from Facebook, and that is, you are, can say, there's are the social media thinking, outlet. And that's not a media outlet, right? Facebook is a media platform. It has all kinds of different data and information flowing across it. People use it irresponsibly, and that's part of what, the, you know, the problem is with the divide now, but that's not CNN or the New York Times or uh, the Detroit... Uh, television stations or newspapers doing that, uh, that's, that's the people who are Facebook. The other thing I think is, is really important is the, the listening that you, that you guys were talking about and media sort of pivoting to spaces where all they're doing is listening, right? Uh, usually we listen as, a, you know, one step in a process to create a story or a documentary or things like that. But where do we, or how do we sort of create spaces where we're just listening and we get people to listen to one another? And 
that's the that's the end game. Uh, I think there's new pressure on media outlets to think about that in, in some new ways. Unfortunately, I think listening is a lost art. People are just waiting to get their point in when someone else is done, and we've talked about this a little bit. Ron, I'm really actually I'm surprised that people trusted you guys enough to bring them into their homes and say, we're going to talk to you and we're going to put you in a documentary about this. When you talked about the media, um, did they wag a finger at you a little bit, or what was, what was the reaction there? Yeah, I'm a little surprised they trusted us, too. But uh, yeah, some some of the families were like that, and and uh, one of the uh, um, women that we just saw here, um, uh, who talked about blaming the media, she was she was very hesitant to talk to us, and she felt that she was that we were going to portray conservatives in a negative light, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that has to do with 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 how the media is broken down now, because everyone has their own media they can go to that that matches their preconceived perceptions of of, of reality. Um, and, and social media obviously makes it worse. All right. Well, you know what? We've run out of time in this discussion. I do want to say, though, um, John, next week that we're going to be part of a summit and a lot yeah. of the conversations that you're going to be having around the state. We're taking a look at education next week in Detroit. Yes, we are. And we're very glad to partner with DPTV in that effort. We in the media, um, uh, we can wring our hands all day. At the end of the day, you have to do something. So. We're trying to adopt to some of the, the, the new tricks today and, and the conferences we're doing are, are broadcast, they're on Facebook. Yeah. Um, we're trying to be in the same spaces <clears throat> as some of the, the new uh, tough climate. And we'll, yeah. look, we'll look forward to that. Ron French, Sean Bebo, thanks so much for joining Thank you. us.